Buenas tardes a todos y a todas y a todes, ¿cómo andan? Espero que, que anden bien, que bueno, que ya la mayoría se encuentre vacunado con la primera dosis o, o en proceso de vacunación para poder salir de esta pandemia que nos, que nos impacta en estos tiempos. Hoy continuamos con los webinars de la Comisión de Exploración y Desarrollo del IAPG, que tiene como lema compartir experiencias y ampliar las miradas. Les recordamos que estos webinars son multidisciplinarios y que se desarrollarán casi todos los jueves del año en el horario de 16 a 18 horas. Se compone de seis ciclos. Últimos descubrimientos exploratorios en la Argentina, magmatismo y sistemas petroleros, exploración offshore, microsísmica, exploración de reservorios shale en la Argentina y campos maduros. La idea de estos webinares es crear un canal que permita la difusión y el intercambio de conocimientos con un enfoque multidisciplinario y que se constituya como un medio de comunicación eficaz entre colegas de las diferentes disciplinas que integran las geociencias, así también como personas de otras profesiones afines a la industria. Hoy continuamos con el ciclo de magmatismo y sistemas petroleros que se compone de 10 webinares para este año 2021. El mismo es una tarea es una de las tareas preparatorias del simposio que lleva el mismo nombre y que formará parte del próximo Congreso de Exploración y Desarrollo de Hidrocarburos, a realizarse en noviembre de 2022 en la ciudad de Mendoza. La idea del ciclo de magmatismo es compartir con la comunidad geológica aquellas contribuciones que ya hayan sido publicadas que traten sobre la participación y los efectos, positivos o negativos, que pueda tener el magmatismo sobre los distintos elementos y procesos del sistema petrolero. En el canal de YouTube del IAPG, ustedes van a poder acceder a todas las charlas del ciclo que se han realizado hasta el momento y hasta esta misma, cuando, bueno, cuando se suba, ¿no? Que generalmente se sube al, día, al otro día o a los dos días ya está subida al canal de YouTube. Queremos agradecerle a todos los oradores que han participado de este ciclo, también a los moderadores, al IAPG, que nos brinda su soporte en la organización y su plataforma, y por supuesto a las empresas que auspician este evento. Hoy tenemos una sola charla a cargo de Dougal Sheram, denominada Hot Rocks and All, Understanding Volcanic Basin from Outcrop to Subsurface. La presentación tendrá una duración aproximada de 50 minutos. Al término de la misma, dispondremos de un intervalo de tiempo para responder preguntas. Las preguntas o comentarios pueden ser formulados por escrito en el panel del chat a la derecha, panel de PIR, preguntas y respuestas. Pueden realizarse en cualquier momento durante la presentación o al terminar la misma. Las preguntas pueden ser realizadas en español o en inglés. También les recordamos que si desean hacer algún comentario de manera oral, pueden solicitar que se les abra el micrófono en el mismo chat, o bien hay una manito que se encuentra en el panel de participantes abajo a la derecha, donde eh, levantan la mano y solicitan eh, el micrófono para poder realizar una pregunta o comentario oral. Bueno, ya explicadas las... Las indicaciones, vamos a pasar a, a presentar al orador de hoy, al doctor Dougal Sheram. Eh, Dougal Sheram es el director de la compañía Dougal Earth, que fue fundada en el año 2011, y es profesor en el CID de Oslo, que es el Centro de Evolución y Dinámica Terrestre de la Tierra, Center for Earth Evolution and Dynamics, de la Universidad de Oslo. Tiene un PhD de la Universidad de Liverpool en el año 1996 y un bachelor en geología de la Universidad de Cardiff en el año 1992. Él ha trabajado durante muchos años en proyectos eh, relacionando la industria con la academia y es un experto en rocas volcánicas y márgenes volcánicos. Eh, los trabajos más recientes en los que ha participado Dual eh, son el proyecto BIMAP, Volcanic Margin Petroleum Prospectivity, que es un proyecto multicliente llevado a cabo por TGS 
y BBTR, Volcanic Basin Petroleum Research, la compañía de Sverre Planque, que también hemos eh, tenido la oportunidad de escucharlo en este ciclo, como también en el ciclo de offshore. Eh, la idea de este, de este proyecto es determinar el estado del arte de la influencia del volcanismo en los sistemas petroleros. Dugal ha publicado más de 100 papers y es eh, muy citado, ¿no? tiene más de 5.600 citaciones, ha publicado libros, ha participado en libros, textos de vulcanología, eh, de petrografía ígnea y metamórfica, y también ha participado en varios videos. Si ustedes entran a su página de Dualer, después pueden ver cómo ha participado en videos de la BBC y otras grandes eh, cadenas de estas que hacen documentales. También ha escrito libros para niños, o sea, que se lo, nosotros no lo tenemos todavía, pero ya le mandamos a pedir algunos para que mande para Argentina, que son muy interesantes para que los chicos y chicas se empiecen a, a involucrar un poco en la geología. Bueno, sin más que esto, vamos a darle paso a Dugal para que dé su presentación. Dugal, are you there? Hello, okay. can you see me? Yes, yeah, we see you perfectly Good. and we hear you very well. Excellent. So, well, thank, thank you, Octavio, for your introduction. And thank also to Hernan, Marta, and to the IAPG for inviting me to talk. Um, I'm going to start my uh, PowerPoint now. Let me just check that you can see this. Is that coming through okay? Yes, perfect. Bueno, bueno, good. So, um, what I want to do today is to introduce some aspects of work that we have been doing on understanding volcanic basins and volcanic margins. Um, and we do this by both looking at outcrop data but also by looking at some of the subsurface data. So I want to give you a feeling of how we can go about trying to unravel the volcanic uh, rocks within a basin. I obviously have a lot of collaborators, so this is a joint effort. And uh, as Octavio said, we are involved in a, in a large scale multi-client project called VMAP, um, volcanic Margin Petroleum Prospectivity, which uh, much of the work we are doing will come from. So just as an introduction, this is uh, getting quite, quite old now, but this map was the first map that started to recognize some of the large igneous provinces around the globe. And um, as I started, um, My first uh, postdoc, when I finished my PhD, I went all the way down to Africa to look at the Etendeka Paraná. And here I was lucky to see these fantastic exposures with almost 100% rock exposed and no vegetation. Um, I was used to more readily working up in, in Scotland, in the, in the North Atlantic province, where there's a lot more green things. There's these, these small, um, Small white things, they're sheep for scale, but we have similar layers of lavas in this area. I was also very lucky to spend some time uh, looking at thick sequences of volcanics within Ethiopia. So this is a, a thick sequence, about 500 meters of volcanics in Ethiopia. I also looked at the Deccan with the uh, I always like these monkeys. It's um, see no volcanics, speak no volcanics, hear no volcanics. <laughs> But again, thick sequences of volcanics. Um, I spent a, a short while in Antarctica looking at some of the plumbing system of volcanic rocks. And more recently, we've been working in um, the Nuken Basin, looking at some of these spectacular um, sills that uh, intrude into. Uh, the subsurface basins and, and trying to understand the petroleum implications of that system. And this is us recently at the LASI conference, um, taking a number of people around those outcrops. So we've spent some time trying to look at the relationship between these large igneous provinces and rifted margins and the sedimentary basin. And there's clearly an overlap We look at the Paraná, Etendeka, the Nuken. We look at the North Atlantic, 
if you look at the Deccan, there's an overlap between the sedimentary basins and the volcanic provinces. And also there's a significant overlap from the onshore to the offshore within these rifted sequences. And that's partly due to the fact that many of these provinces are associated with continental rifted margin. And that's quite important because although we can see aspects of the outcrops onshore, we are often exploring or trying to understand the uh, basins offshore and, and how much of the volcanics are a problem. So this is an old image I used in, in 2002 to identify some of the problems with the offshore sequences, because you can have thick sequences of basalts and they strongly affect the seismic imaging beneath them. This is a problem which has been called the sub basalt imaging problem. And you can see where you don't have the basalts, you get very good imaging. More recently, there has been a lot of work trying to sort of unravel the, the internal architecture of the geology between the, the, the top of the lava and the base of the lava. And there's been some good work within TGS where they have taken old seismic data and improved through reprocessing some of the imagery so that you can actually start to see um, structures within the volcanics. And it's exactly that what I want to talk about today, understanding the internal architecture of some of these thick volcanic sequences. Well, if we go to volcanic margins, you can look at the sequences at a number of different scales. And primarily, there are three major scales. There are scales which we might call the micro scale, where we're looking at things on a millimeter to meter scale. So essentially within the lava sequences themselves and even down to the petrographic microscope. We then have the meso scale where we actually look at the relationships of different units almost from a stratigraphic and a log sense within a basin. And then we look at the large scale. So we move from the outcrop scale towards the seismic scale and even the continental margin scale. So these these transitions is where we need to be able to make a good understanding from the real geology to the subsurface seismic remotely sensed geology. And this is where there's a big problem because within volcanic rocks, there's a vast variation in rock properties. And one example is if you just take a simple lava flow. So here we have uh, the base of a lava sequence. The main interior or core part of the lava and then the upper crustal part and there's the top of the lava flow. And this could be a lava flow of five meters thickness, but it could even be up to 50 meters thickness. What's important here is that the interior, the core part of the lava flow is fresh crystalline much of the gas has been escaped while it was cooling. So this behaves with the, the properties that we'd expect for basalts. The problem when we go to the upper transition zone and the altered flow top is that here we have lots of uh, fractures. We may even have sediments at the top of the lava sequence. So the rock properties in this region, if we take velocity as an example, are much more reduced compared to the massive interior. And this can be really quite marked. If we look at simple um, distributions of shales and sandstones, limestones, chalk and salt, et cetera, we have these broad uh, zones in terms of their velocity. But when we look at volcanic rocks, we have everything that covers all of those ranges and a significant amount more. And even more worrying is if you just go to one single lava flow, like we looked at, that can have a range which covers all of the ranges of the different sedimentary, sedimentary groups. So it can be rather challenging to understand the volcanic rocks in the subsurface from their uh, petrophysical perspective. And this is quite important because we know from the outcrops that we have many, many stacked lava flows in some of these large igneous provinces. And we might be wanting to look at the sediments beneath the volcanics in terms of, of a petroleum prospect, for example, 
but we have to try and image through such a sequence. And just to give you a feel, this would be uh, a, a sort of velocity profile through such a sequence of volcanics. But this is actually the, se the seismic wavelet through that. So there's a real problem in trying to resolve these issues. As I said, improved um, reprocessing of some of these images can help with that, but we're still often faced with a little bit of noise and uncertainty within the volcanic rocks as to what we're seeing. Another problem is when we start to drill through volcanic rocks. So this is some work that I did with John Millet a few years back, looking at the problems associated with drilling. So you could imagine that you're drilling through the subsurface, you're into a sedimentary basin fill, and then you come into some, some volcanic units. And because you have this very marked variation in velocity, from very high velocity to very low velocity, very high velocity, very low velocity, you get a very variable rate of penetration. Okay, and obviously the rate of penetration is intrinsically linked to how much it costs to drill. Another problem we face with is that in some instances, the top of the lava sequences can be quite porous. So you potentially have fluid losses that again can be expensive. So trying to understand where you might have high porosity and permeability versus low porosity and permeability within the sequence is important. Also, because the volcanic rocks in terms of their petrographic and petrological um, and petrophysical relationships, you can sometimes have problems with overpressure and also going from a solid medium into a muddy medium. So there's potential risk management coming out of the volcanics and into uh, the sub-volcanic sediments. And we know this from real data. So it, it, this is obviously a schematic representation of this, but here we have a log from real data set showing some of the caliper um, some of the breakouts that you get as you're drilling through some of these sequences where there's fractured volcanics, there's lava flow top versus core and crust relationships. And then as you go into the sediments and you get these different picks from the sill. So this is a real potential issue. Another issue um, is, is the quality of the data that we have in the subsurface. In an ideal sense, we would like to see everything from uh, thin sections of sidewall cores or even thin sections from core material. We would love to have whole cores through many sections, but obviously within volcanics, this is often not the case because they're not necessarily the desirable rock to uh, drill through. And so what we find is that although we might want a, 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 a nice suite of data, we're usually left with well log data. We may have some ditch cutting information. If we're lucky, we might have some core plugs. And we're trying to match this with our subsurface geophysics. And so this is this is where we, we're sort of coming at the problem. Okay. So some years back, this is ooh, now 2002, so quite a few years ago, almost 20 years ago, um, I came up with a um, a description of some of the internal packaging or internal geometries that you see within the volcanic sequences. Up until this stage, people studying large igneous provinces were more interested in the geochemistry, into the into the sort of petrogenesis of the system. But I started realizing that actually, if you have a big 3D distribution of volcanics within a basin, you need to approach it in the same way that you might approach a sedimentary basin system, and that is to look at geometries and um, fascist relationships. And just to show you some examples, here's a nice outcrop example from the Isle of Skye in Scotland, and you can start to see these individual, quite well pronounced lava flows that are um, overlapping each other in the sequence. So quite nice, simple, classic uh, lava flows that you can see. When we go to some of the larger outcrops, this is um, this one here is from Ethiopia. So that's uh, about 500 meters of stacked lava flows. 
And this is from the Deccan in India, about 300 meters of stack lava flows. You can see that you have this internal architecture, very similar to a thick sedimentary fill where you have different onlap and downlap and toplap relationships. I spent a lot of my time looking at the uh, transition from sediments to lavas within the Etendeka Paraná in Africa. And here we have a lovely sequence of sandstones at the base transitioning into lava flows at the top. And in between, we have this sequence where the sediments uh, intermingle with the, with the volcanics. So here, the sedimentary system was active at the same time as the volcanic system. And what's nice about this is we can go up to the outcrops, we can look at them and try and interrogate what's going on. And we can then take that even further and look at the microscale variations in the rocks. So this gives us a very good understanding of these systems. So if we in intersect such a system within a core or within a well, we might be able to get some more information about how these things form. And just like looking at the sedimentary sequences within a basin, we're trying to get an understanding of the likely 3D distribution. So we're like, if, we're, if we think we're somewhere here within the system, we want to know that if we move this way towards uh, the basin, do we see a change in volcanic fasces? Or if we move this way, do we see a different change in volcanic fasces? And that's really the goal. And so just as part of this introduction, I've shown you that the, the different volcanic fasces can vary uh, within the volcanic stratigraphy. And it's important to realize that, that by looking at these things in detail, both in outcrop and in the subsurface, we may be able to better understand the deposits. And so what I want to do now is to look at the link between the different fasces types that we see in large igneous provinces and the rock properties in order to try and get a link from what we see in the geology to what we um, visualize in the geophysics. So this is a lovely example of the stratigraphy that we see through the North Atlantic Igneous Province. This is a, um, an, an outcrop uh, log interpretation from the Faroe Islands in the North Atlantic Igneous Province. And here we have a sequence of um, subaqueous hyaloclastite um, fragmented volcanics and then a sequence of layered lava flows of different style. And we have, what's good about this is we have cores that run through this. So we have subsurface information about exactly the same outcrops. So here's a, um, a couple of um, snapshots through that stratigraphy. And we can see that we can start to interrogate the velocity, the density, gamma ray responses and so on through such sequences where we actually know what the lithologies are. And that's where I'm going to go now. If we look at the lava flow stratigraphy, in general, you have three main lava flow types. You have one units which form thick, tabular, very consistent and easy to spot lava flows. You have sequences which are much more chaotic. The flows themselves are very, very thin, and they seem to almost, almost be like a braided river system. And then you can find thick sequences where the volcanic lava flows have entered the water and start to fragment and form large delta sequences. So these three volcanic fasces are fairly common within volcanic margins. They're not the only volcanic fasces that exist, but I'm focusing on them because they're very common. And what's nice is we have good examples from the subsurface data through cores and wells going through such stratigraphy. So we can look at the velocity profiles in tabula, in what we call compound flows, and in what we call hyaloclastite. So these fragmented flows, these thin, very complex lava flows, and these much more systematic, very obvious lava flows. And we can go in back into the field and we can look 
that lovely thick sheet like tabular flows. We can find sequences where internally they're very, very complex, these compound braided flows, or we can find thick sequences of hyaloclastite forceps. And by looking at these key flow fasces in, in the subsurface, we can start to interrogate what their velocity profile looks like. And this is quite useful because quite often we would only have uh, wireline log signatures in the volcanic. So we would only be able to see things like velocity and density and gamma ray variation. So if we can see patterns within the velocity profiles, for example, which tell us that we're in tabular flows versus compound flows versus hyaloclastites, then we can start to make some um, progress in trying to interpret the subsurface data. And as you can see by these profiles, the tabular flows, because of their thick interior cores, have a predominant peak of high velocity. Compound flows have a much more broad and mixed uh, velocity profile. And the hyaloclastites are actually quite tight in their profile. So they get a fairly tight volcanic profile. And again, here are the examples of those different fasces in terms of a kind of 3D geometry, if you want to think about them in terms of their 3D architecture. What's useful then is we can look at some of the other subsurface data we might have. And sometimes we have uh, image log data. So we might have some uh, nice FMI image log data. So again, we don't have any core, but we have wireline signatures and now we have image log. And we can match up the image log signatures with some of these wireline signatures that we that we're spotting from the velocity. And again, we can use those to help interpret the volcanic sequences. And these are just a couple of examples from what's known as the Rose Bank, which is actually a, uh, an interbedded volcanic discovery in the North Atlantic. But ideally, if we have the best possible situation, we would be able to have complete core through our volcanics and also a complete set of subsurface geophysical data, such as wireline log information, et cetera. And this case study does exist. We spent some time working with colleagues in, in Hawaii, and we looked at uh, a couple of core sequences, the PTA-2 and the KMA-1, where they drilled uh, nearly um, three kilometers or so worth of uh, volcanic rocks, and they cored them 100%. And what we did was we came on board and we did the down borehole geophysics for them. So we we have all of the core plus the down borehole um, wireline log data. And in doing so, we're able to match exactly what's happening with the gamma, for example, or density or velocity, directly with the core observation. So we can directly interpret what's happening to this data. The other thing that's important is we also took image log data. So again, we can match what we see in the image log exactly with the core. And the reason why this is so surprising is normally we would only have image log. We wouldn't have any of the volcanics to be able to, to ground truth or fully um, realize what we're seeing in, in the image log data. And so that's the reason why this data set is, is uh, quite valuable. And I published this in um, 2019. Um, it, it's available through the International Science Drilling um, website. I think it's, it's a free download. So uh, I can pass the links on to Octavio later. Another thing that we've been working on is actually measuring the petrophysical properties of the rocks. So if you take a lava flow, you can have everything from, as we've talked about, from solid basalt to something which has quite a lot of vesicles and porosity and permeability within it. 
and that can all be within the same flow unit. Okay, and here's just two nice field examples of more solid material and material with lots and lots of vesicles in it. And what we're doing is we're building up a database of the different rock properties that you see with parameters such as frost G versus P wave velocity to understand the different fascias within the volcanics and what that means within um, the subsurface petrophysics. Now, this is important because when we looked in the literature, there were very well known curves for gales, for example, through burial, for sandstones through burial. We use these quite regularly in trying to understand the frosty permeability relationships with burial. But there was very little information about volcanics. And what we did find was that any of the experimental information showed that the rocks themselves are very strong. So even if you start with a certain porosity at the surface, unless you do something to the rock, the porosity will stay the same pretty much at quite big depths. And that's because. The way in which the porosity is changed within volcanic rocks is usually due to alteration. So here's two examples. One where we have the porosity that's open, the vesicles are open. The second one is the vesicles have been filled by a secondary mineral. In this case, it's zeolite and calcite. So you can have two scenarios here. One, you start with a fairly high porosity. And you bury the rock, but you don't fill that porosity. The rock itself has an intrinsic strength, and so it actually maintains that porosity to quite significant depths. And this is done experimentally through high pressure um, experimental systems. You can get all the way down to two and a half, three kilometers equivalent of depth before the rock fails. Conversely, you could have the same rock. And if you have an early hydrothermal reaction in the system and fill the pore spaces, your porosity reduces dramatically. And so within the same rock, you might have one scenario where the porosity remains open, another scenario where the porosity reduces. Is that, is that a true re re reflection of the rocks? Well, actually it is, because again, we have drill data, so we go back to our schematic um, view of drilling through volcanic rocks. We might expect to find fractures where we can have fluid loss, sediments where we have fluid loss. But if we have porous lava flow tops with lots of vesicles, if they remain open, there could be high fluid loss there. If they're closed, however, there would be very little permeability and so that might not be a problem. And here's a couple of examples from a well that was drilled. They found a horizon where they lost lots of fluid and the cuttings that came up from that horizon were clearly vol vesicular volcanic rocks that were open. All of the vesicles were open. So this had a high porosity, high permeability top. Further down, they cut through the same sort of stratigraphy, but here the vesicles were filled. And here there were no losses. So we can see that this has a direct influence on how you um, drill through volcanic rock. So what about linking with the seismic? So here's just a nice um, seismic section from the Norwegian margin. And I wanted to just touch on some of the things that we know well and some of the things we don't know so well when we try and interpret volcanic rocks and seismic from these marges in these provinces. So here's an interpretation of those units. So I'll just skip back. You can see we have these lateral connected lava flows. We then have these dipping surfaces. And we then have these more chaotic and different, different reflectors. So what we see here is a series of lava flows, a lava delta sequence, some 
submarine or difficult to interpret volcanic rocks and then some intrusions within the subsurface sediments. So we interpret these to be lava flows, lava delta. There's a seismic fasces called inner flows, which we're not so certain about the actual information. And there's also sills within the lava sequences, which in some instances can be imaged, in other instances are difficult to image. So we're very happy with understanding our lava flows. We have good onshore analogs for these. Our lava deltas, we have good onshore analogs, but we're less, less happy with understanding the inner flows and our seals can sometimes be difficult to image. So again, we go back to our um, key volcanic fascines. We can look at them in terms of the sort of geometries that we think we see. We can look at things like their velocity profiles and we can start to try and understand the seismic. And it's by linking these onshore analogs at seismic scale with the seismic observations that we start to make some progress. And so I wanted to focus now on this complex area that we call inner flows, where it's the transition from subaerial to subaqueous or marine volcanism. Quite a problematic area. And it's quite important because in a lot of volcanic margins, the exploration is targeted around where the large igneous province feathers out and becomes more of a sedimentary province. And so trying to understand this area in terms of risks from the volcanics, are the volcanics important as seals, as reservoirs, etc., becomes important. And because this area is important, we, we have a number of issues associated with it, particularly the air itself seems to be relatively thin in terms of the volcanics, but often the imaging is very much affected by these volcanic rocks because they're very um, heterogeneous and problematic in their, in their morphologies. So here are just some examples of, of the different units that we see. We have a major rock type called hyaloclastite. These are fragmented um, lava flows that enter uh, the seaway, that enter the, enter the water and fragment and become essentially a big lava delta sequence. And here's a lovely example from Iceland. You can look at some of those in a bit more detail. Sometimes you have fragments of pillow basalts broken up in them. We also see thick sequences of pillow lavas. So in some instances, the rocks don't fragment, they actually form pillow lavas. We see an interesting thing called uh, invasive flows where the lava flows themselves are going along the sediment and then suddenly they become a shallow intrusion. They dip down into the sediment. And we also sometimes see a dynamic interaction between the sediments and the volcanics. If the sediments are soft and wet, you can sometimes get this dynamic interaction. So there's a whole range of potential uh, sort of rock types within there. But what can we say about the actual geometries? Well, this is a nice example from Angola, and I'd like you to focus on what I've labeled the top basalt. And you can see here that that volcanic horizon is jumping up and down within the sequence. It's not very clear as to what the actual contact relationships between the volcanics and the sediments are. And this is quite an important observation because in such an example, we just run that again. In such an example, whoop, I went all the way back. Me. In such an example, if you're running a seismic line across this volcanic interval, the transition from the sediments to the volcanics is gonna be a very large kick in the velocity. But if the surface is very, very rough, it's gonna be very, very scattering in terms of the seismic. So this might be one of the reasons why, even with relatively thin volcanic units, we see a marked heterogeneity. 
What about the third dimension? We talked at the start of the talk about trying, wanting to understand the 3D variations within the rock. So I've been involved in a number of studies over the years where we've tried to build 3D models of um, these volcanic sequences. And I'll go through some of the examples that we've, that we've put together. Initially, I think the, the, one of the first 3D um, models came out of studies of um, examples in Namibia and examples in Scotland where we did a lot of ground mapping we ran a lot of log sections, just like you do in sedimentology, and we correlated these log sections over the 3D basin. And we used software called GoCAD and, and um, other 3D mapping software to interpolate the surfaces. So very similar to how you might address a sedimentary sequence onshore. Then as technology built, we took laser scanners into the field. And we made 3D laser scanned outcrop models. And we used those outcrop models to build up an understanding of the internal geology. So in doing that, we can produce a kind of theoretical sort of 3D model of the geology, but that, that theoretical model is based on real um, observations. So the velocities, the densities, the surfaces, come from the real outcrops and we interpolate the 3D cube, which we can then start to look at in terms of velocities and, and so on. More recently, and I'd like to show a nice example of this, we have the advent of drones and we've been able to use drone technology to map out. We, here we're mapping, this is my colleague John Howe from the University of Aberdeen, mapping modern volcanoes. But we can also go to our outcrops and produce some fantastic 3D outcrop models. And I'd like to show you, before I finish the talk, one example of the work we're doing. And that comes from Paranara and Decaflub Basalt Province. I talked a little bit about this at the start. The Etendeka part is located in Namibia on the African side, but it's part of an extension of the Paranara et and Decaflub Basalt Province. It erupted around 135 to 133 million years ago. And what's really interesting about this is the onset of volcanism has this lava sediment preserved interaction. So in some ways, in the offshore sequences within um, the, the South Atlantic margins, this is a, a sort of pre-salt target. So this is... Um, a, a Google Earth view of, um, of Namibia, and you can see immediately one of the reasons for working in Namibia is there's very little vegetation. This is a big desert system, and you can see all of the colors here are actually given up by the, the colors of the geology. There's no, there's no vegetation to be, to be worried about. As we zoom in, you can see there's a couple of areas where we've done some of our 3D models, but I wanted to show you this because it shows the extent of the outcrop. You can see a little bit of vegetation in the river, in the dry river valleys, some occasional river floods, but essentially you have brown volcanic rocks, you have yellow and light brown sedimentary rocks, and that's really all you can see. And the way we do the geology, it's it's quite a remote area to get to. We take four by fours with all of our equipment in. As you can see, the outcrops are, are almost 100% outcrops. We have one or two nice uh, companions uh, in the field. Sometimes you have wild zebras and so on. But essentially, what we're doing is we're taking this drone technology and building a complete virtual 3D outcrop that we can then go back to the lab and, and interrogate. We've done this for a number of systems, and I'm going to just show you one example. I'm going to show you Dune Valley, which is one of our larger 3D models. This is about 4.3 kilometers long and about 350 meters thick. So it's a very seismic scale outcrop that we're looking at, but we've done a number of others, and that's part of the BMAP um, projects that we're, that we're doing. So to show you, so this is our, our, our model. So again, the satellite image that I showed, 
And then highlighted here is the extent to which we have the drone coverage of our 3D model. And just to give you a feel, uh, in brown, we've got volcanics. In orange and white, we have uh, different types of, of, of sandstone. And here's the, the sort of geology interpreted onto those um, surfaces. Uh, and again, to point out the colors, in purple and pink, we have volcanic rocks. And in orange and yellow, we have sedimentary rocks. And there's some dark green rocks you'll see which are intrusions. So that just gives you a feel for the color variation. So here is the 3D um, model that we have. And there's a number of things to observe. The first thing to observe is we see this transition from the lowermost stratigraphy in, in the sandstones up into the volcanics. And I'll show you a nice little um, anima animation of this in a short while. This gives you a feel. This is It's a little bit jumpy because the, the plane has quite a bit of turbulence when we flew over, but you can see just the scale of these outcrops and the extent of exposure. You can see all of these different sediment interlayers within the volcanic horizons. It's a really beautiful um, outcrop. And I think what's what's most important is when you look at the 3D model, you can see the, the, the sheer seismic scale of the observations we're making. So we're looking at uh, an outcrop model of, as I say, three and a half or so kilometers with um, a few hundred meters of stratigraphy. So really quite uh, incredible outcrop. So just to show you, obviously, having this as a 3D model means that we can zoom in, we can interrogate the geology. Here we've interpreted the different sedimentary units and volcanic units just to show you their outcrop uh, signatures. We can populate this model with different um, rock properties. There's a transition from the satellite image to the interpreted image. Here's an example where the intrusion cuts through. So it's a really powerful way of interrogating our, our data set. And what we've been doing as well is to uh, use this data set now to potentially run what we call virtual field trips. And given our, our current COVID situation, it's very hard for us to get out into the field but we can actually go and visit some of the outcrops from a virtual sense. And here you can see the stratigraphy, this transition from a thick sedimentary sequence towards the base, going up into this volcanic sequence, and in between we've had, we have these isolated sedimentary sequences. One of the things that we found quite unique about this particular example is that we, um, we found that within the sequence, there were some rather uniquely preserved sedimentary bed forms. So here you can see, this is what you see from the satellite image. You zoom in, you can see this barkanoid form to one of the sand bodies. When you go round and measure the dips on the forceps, you can see that this is actually a barkan dune that was preserved by the volcanic. Now, normally, bark and dunes do not get preserved in the in the fossil record because they are above base level. They are just a transient bed form. But because we have lava flows here, the lavas actually freeze the sedimentary system when the next lava flow engulfs it. And so one of the things that we learned was that the volcanics preserve the sedimentary parts uh, of the system that are not normally preserved. And that's something that we've come to learn a lot about from uh, our volcanic margin study. So I wanted to just show you some of, this is some of the, the recent modern work we're doing by utilizing drone technology to help interpret some of our really large data sets. So I guess in summary, because it would be nice to, to get some questions from people. Um, our approach is to look at um, this variable rock property variation within volcanic units from the outcrop scale, from the individual lava flow scale, through from the sort of outcrop field area to regional scale, 
and then try and draw those observations into what we can understand from the seismic scale. And in doing so, we've built up a nice catalog of understanding of the volcanic units from large scale interpretations of volcanic margins, like my colleague Sarah Planka has spent most of his time working as a geophysics geophysicist looking at the volcanic margins. Looking at regional variations within volcanic stratigraphy, but also understanding the internal architecture of individual flows and how those flows interact with each other as they fill up the sedimentary basin. As I say, a lot of what I've presented is part of uh, our volcanic margins petroleum prospectivity project. We're now in phase two of that of that work. We have uh, completed phase one. And the, the, this is a nice resource for the industry. If, if, if anyone is interested in following up uh, in more detail, they can contact myself or Sarah. Um, but, but that's where a lot of what I've shown has, has come from uh, to give you a feel for the way we're trying to bridge the understanding from academia into industry. And so with that, I shall close a picture of myself and Sarah in front of the lava flow in Iceland, not the recent one, but one in, in 2015. This one here, the Baba Bunga eruption, but also a fantastic outcrop from the subsurface uh, plumbing system of volcanics in, uh, in Antarctica to show you that basically looking at the system from outcrop to subsurface is, 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 I think, the way forward. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope you're all still there somewhere. Thank you, Dagal, very much. It was an excellent presentation. Very nice, very nice examples of how you connect the, the subsurface imaging with the outcrop was really, really interesting. And also how you use all the available technologies to, to try to interpret this, this environment, no? these volcanic machines. So now I will give some uh, recommendation for the questions in Spanish, and then I will make you the question in English. Yes, yeah, sure. Les recordamos que pueden realizar sus preguntas en el panel de preguntas y respuestas que se encuentra en la parte inferior derecha de la pantalla. Aquellas personas que quieren hacer una pregunta oral lo pueden solicitar al chat o pueden levantar la manito. El botón de la mano se encuentra en el panel de participantes abajo a la derecha y se les abrirá el micrófono para que puedan realizar sus comentarios o preguntas orales. Ok, now we are going to start with the first question from Enrique Feinstein. He asked, are there any examples where volcanic rocks that maintain porosity with depth behave like hydrocarbon reservoir rocks in the North Sea? Yes, uh, Enrique, thank you for the question. The, the, um, the answer to that is yes. Um, the, the example that I showed where we had um, the, the velocity and, and the uh, breakout information as you go down with depth, depth was through a two kilometer thick sequence of volcanics. And even at a kilometer's um, depth, uh, they had complete uh, fluid losses. So they, they reached a horizon where the porosity and permeability was still maintained at a kilometer thickness of volcanics. Um, and the, 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 the permeability was so much that they lost all of the drilling fluid. In another example, there is a reservoir called Cambo, where we actually see some hydrocarbons preserved within the vesicles and fractures in the top of the volcanic unit. And a third example, but this is actually from the South Atlantic, there's a, um, a reservoir called the Badagio Reservoir that was um, produced by Petrobras for many <laughs> years. And that comes from uh, oil within the uh, vesicles and fractures of lava flows. So we do see examples mm -hmm. Where, where this this occurs, yes. Okay, thank you. There we have another question from Camilo Aristizabal. Uh, 
He said, dear Dougal, you is a pretty beautiful presentation. Do you think it will be effective to frag magmatic reservoirs to link its backs? As well, it's done with non-conventional ones. Again, again, that's a very good question, and the and the answer to that is yes. Um, we we worked with um, mm -hmm. a company in India, and they have a ga gas uh, gas and oil reservoirs, predominantly gas reservoirs in some of the Deccan rocks, and those gas reservoirs are very tight, and they actually use fracking to induce the fractures to join up the reservoir properties a bit more and to get some of the gas out. So they have gas hosted volcanic rocks. They're a little bit altered and uh, they find it difficult to to get uh, sometimes the porosity permeability mm -hmm. situation correct. So they use fracking to enhance the, the permeability. So it's definitely something that could be done. And I, uh, you know, for example, within some of the the sill um, examples in the Guacamata for formation, for example, that could be a process which is which would help uh, get get some of the particularly. It I think it becomes more of a problem when you have a an, an oil prone reservoir as opposed to a gas prone reservoir because again, trying to get the permeabilities is hard. Okay, thank you, Dago. Do well. And now we have another question from Marta Dangela. He say, she says, sorry, thank you, Dougal, for your nice presentation. Do you believe density logs combined with acoustic response could be useful for volcanic plastic phases discrimination? It, it's possible. I mean, one of the one of the problems we have is that uh, volcanic plastic rocks can look very similar to, for example, the top parts of lava flows, because essentially they're, the, they're very similar in their geometries in what's in, in the rocks themselves. So what we find is that um, if you have uh, a chemical log, that can be very useful because you can show in a volcanic, in a true volcanoclastic system, you might have quite a bit more influence of some of the other sedimentary systems. So you might get some siliciclastics in there. You might be able to see that within the chemical variation. The other thing that we find very useful is image log, because as you go up through the volcanic fasces, when you're in a lava flow, you can see that the upper parts of the lava flow, which might have the same signatures as volcanoclastic rocks, are actually just the upper parts of lava flows because you can map the images from one to the other, even if you don't have any log or any uh, any uh, sorry, any core or any sidewall core information, you can see the patterns within the sequence, but also visualize them within the image log. So I think the image log is 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 probably the best way forward when you when you're not going to be coring the the, the rocks themselves. Okay, thank you. We have one comment from Patricia, Patricia Sroga. She said, excellent presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you. Then we have another question from Enrique Feinstein. He said, according to your experience, would you say that in the oil fields related to highly fractured volcanic rocks, the water oil contact rise up as a table or as a coning around the well balls? as an effect of the main fractures permeability system. Okay, uh, um, I, I think I think I, I get what you're what you're on about here. There's 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 a couple of issues that you can have within volcanic sequences. One of them is that sometimes the pressure between different um, high permeability zones can be different. And they can be separated by an impermeability horizon. So, for example, in Columbia River, where they drill through the volcanic units to get water reservoirs, they're trying to get aquifers to feed their um, plants and their and their vegetation. They sometimes find that as they drill through the volcanics, the the water table changes when they connect to volcanic units, and it actually rises because there's a there's an, 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 
a non-connection before they drill, and then there's a connection where they drill, which this suggests that in some situations you can have some overpressure. And I guess if you have overpressure within the in in the the permeability be either between volcanic units or beneath them, when you penetrate those with wells, that overpressure, it might only be a small overpressure, but that can cause variations in the water table. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I think we don't have more questions in the chat panel. I have two questions for you. Uh, one is according to your experience, uh, if you have a conclusion of which are the better phases for petroleum prospectivity as volcanic reservoirs? So I would say um, it's, it's thick lava flow sequences where you have a very well developed uh, crust on top of the lava flows. Um, the, the reason for that is that when you have crystalline lava, it is much better than having something like a, a hyaloclastite, which is very glassy. So when you have these volcanoclastic rocks, you think, oh, great, they're, they're volcanoclastic, they're sedimentary. But the problem is they alter very easily, and very quickly. So you, you very quickly change the porosity permeability situation because you fill the, the porosity with secondary minerals. With the lava flows, we've seen definite examples where the, the reservoir properties of the lava flow tops are preserved. We see that in, in water aquifers in the Columbia River basalts. We see it in some of the lava flows in Iceland where they're using the hydrothermal uh, fluid migration through the lava tops to produce energy. And we see that in some of the subsurface examples. So for me, it would be thick lava flow sequences where the crust of the lava flows are very thick. Okay, thank you. And my second question is, in all of these volcanic margins where you have worked, have you seen some volcanic clastic phases? Because you talk a lot of lava flows and yellow clastites, but I don't know if there are some pyroclastic units uh, interbedded in the system or not. Yes, no, very, very much so. I mean, I, I, I concentrated, um, as I said in the talk, I concentrated on the three sort of different basaltic fascias that we see. But we often see um, pyroclastic units. We often see reworked uh, volcanic units in the sediments. And that's where, in many ways, the problems start to happen because um, trying once you start to mix sediments with volcanics in in a reworked sedimentary system, you go from volcanoclastic rocks to what we call epiclastic rocks when you have less than twenty percent volcanics. These can become very difficult to interpret when you don't have um, sidewall core or core information because the the responses in terms of the wireline logs and other other si signatures in the subsurface can be difficult so yes we do see them and we do get them um but uh i i didn't concentrate on some of those examples i could use i could do a whole a whole different talk on uh different volcanic plastic fashies uh so you'll have to invite me back again i can imagine okay you're more than welcome <laughs> so we have another question here in the chat panel from hernan de la cal he asked in most indigenous English provinces, will it be possible to make a characterization of England brights, like the flow examples that you show? Do you have experience? Yes. Yeah, so, so we have started to look at um, the. I guess the first thing to say is that in in the, the Silicic large igneous provinces, which I've worked on, in general, are very much. Um, in the minority compared to the Mafic provinces, which is why we, we tended to concentrate on the Mafic provinces, because there's much more subsurface information in the Mafic provinces. In the Silicic provinces, we're starting to get some core information, some well information, and so on. So we're able to start to interpret the fascias within the Silicic system. That said, there are problems because 
uh, in terms of the composition of the rocks, you start to move uh, things like gamma gamma in in the in the um, wireline signatures is a problem because the silicic rocks are much more um, radioactive. So you end up with with gamma signals that can be very similar to shales and and, and other things. So so we are developing a fasci system as part of VMAP two. We are studying very much detail the what we call transitional and evolved sequences. And so we, we do see very similar um, architectural patterns, but they're, they're obviously uh, different from the matrix system, but they are systematic. So we are, we, we, we're partly developing that, and we, we, we hope to be publishing on some of that soon. Okay, very good. We have another question from Leandro Delia. He says, thank you for the nice presentation. The question is, in successions of lavas without intercalation of auto breaches carapace, how do you recognize a succession without AA carapace erase for erosion or a succession, succession of inflate flows without development of AA or in block Carapace. I think it says carapace. No? Yeah, yeah. No, this is this is this is a good question. And, and ult ultimately, when you go when you go and look at modern lava sequences, um, you have a range from Pahoe Hoe through Aha, and you have a range from sheet flows to sometimes ponded flow units, like like um, Leonardo uh, mentions. And and so this can be difficult. The important thing is that even in a Pahoe Hoe sequence, which doesn't have a big brecciated uh, top part, it still has a significant amount of uh, increased fracturing and vesicularity at the top surface. So what happens is as the lava flow is inflating, the interior of the flow, the gas is escaping to the top, uh, and this top is cooling. So you find the top contains more vesicles and more um, fractures than the, the interior. So even if it's not very broken up, it still has a higher percentage of vesicles, which means that the velocity and the density decrease. And so you still see a, a, a decrease in the, in the properties at the top surface of even these flows which don't have a breccia. So that's an important thing. And that's how you can differentiate them from sills, where the sills have a sharp base and a sharp top, and then a very sort of common internal pattern, maybe with some fracturing in certain places, but essentially they're a bit easier to interpret. So that is a good observation. And you see that you'll see some publications that describe the hoey hoey, doubly the hoey hoey, aha, there's a whole sort of transition of different flow fasces. But in general, all of those flow fasces have variations in the in the upper parts of the flow, which are different from the interior. Perfect, very clear. So I think that there are no more questions in the chat panel. So I have the last question. What's next? So what do you think we have to do to better understand these environments? Well, actually, hold hold this page. Because at the moment, or in two weeks, um, we start a, an IODP cruise to the Norwegian margin, where they will be drilling through some of the volcanic sequences. So here we have much more opportunity to get thick poured sequences through the volcanics, because normally in industry, you may drill through the volcanics, but you avoid coring them. So we we hope to have a number of different scientific cores through um, the volcanic sequences. And we have also put in an IODP proposal to, to drill some of the seaward dipping reflectors offshore Argentina with Sfera and, and other co-workers. So, so again, we're trying to get more information about the subsurface because I think we are, we're at the point where we have lots of good onshore analogs. We have good basins to look at onshore, the new can, the Paranara and Deca, etc. And what we want to be able to do is get the good data in the subsurface offshore, then make make those comparisons.
Okay, perfect. So thank you very much. Do well. I will give the last uh, recommend, not recommendation, like the advices of the next webinars in Spanish. So I say goodbye to you. Thank you very much. Excellent thank you all for your time and your your attention. Thank you.